Coming up, two crews launch into space. Juno has a hiccup. I have an interview with Dave Mastin in studio. And I crack up on air thanks to our live audience. All of that and more coming up on this week's episode of Tomorrow. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 9.34 for October 22nd, 2016. Now, before we get started with our episode, we first want to thank all of our patrons on Patreon who give us $10 or more per episode. These folks are our tomorrow premiere patrons. They get access to everything in our Slack channel. So thank you to these patrons. And if you would like to help consider crowdfunding the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash t. M R O. Now, of course, I am your host through the news, Jared Head, and next to me, I've got Space Mike from the mythical lands of Arizona, very far away uh, from us here, of course, in the studio in Anaheim. Now, uh, we're going to get started with you, Mike, because we've got a, a nice array of exciting things to start off with. So, go ahead, Mike. That's right. We try to st start each show at the top of it with space launches, and we have quite a few of them. First up, we have a Long March 2F rocket, which launched the Senzo 11 capsule into space. This launched on Sunday, October 16th at 2330, Coordinated Universal Time, from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. This carried two Taikonauts on board, bound for the Tiangon-2 space station, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They could have taken three crew members on board, but uh, they wanted to take up more supplies instead, so they uh, only had two crew members on this particular mission. And then uh, next up, we have a Cygnus, or rather an Antares launch, which launched the Cygnus cargo vehicle. This launched on Monday, October 17th at 2345 Coordinated Universal Time from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport at Wallops Island, Virginia. I love the shaking on that first part. Uh, this was the first Antares launch since 2014, the first launch with the new Russian RD-181 engines, and it carried the sixth Cygnus cargo mission for the Commercial Resupply Services program, but it was designated OA-5 and also called the SS Allen Poindexter, so congratulations to Orbital ATK for that successful launch. But then next up, we have a Soyuz launch, which launched on Wednesday, October 19th at 8.05 Coordinated Universal Time from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And this was launching a Soyuz capsule, specifically the MS-02 capsule, which carried with it cosmonauts Sergei Rizhikov, Andrei Borisenko, and also the astronaut Shane Kimbra. And this was going to be bound for the International Space Station, which we'll talk about in a few moments. So uh, congratulations to Roscosmos and to NASA for this successful launch. Yes, a fantastic week of launches happening uh, throughout the world, although we do have uh, a little bit of an issue with something that's occurring off of the world about a billion miles away from us with NASA's oh. Juno probe. Uh, so engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in the Los Angeles area are troubleshooting the issues. Uh, it's currently in orbit around Jupiter and in testing for preparation for an engine burn to place it into its 14-day science orbit. Delivered data showed that two valves on board were operating significantly slower than needed. These valves control the helium pressurization system for the main engine, and they are designed to open a few seconds, uh, but it took several minutes for the valves to open during the test. So mission managers opted to skip that burn and take an extra 53-day orbit before attempting another burn to put it in a 14-day orbit. But then during the close pass to Jupiter, Juno went into safe mode and all science from that orbit was lost. So Juno's perfectly fine, but unfortunately any science that was done on that orbit is uh, gone. So uh, yeah, there goes the data. Now, uh, Mike, we want to get back to talking about Shenzhou 11. So go ahead and take it away. Well, just two days after launch, uh, they successfully rendezvoused with the Tiangong-2 space station. And uh, this, uh, they were able to successfully dock with the space station on October 18th, which was a uh, Tuesday, at 1924 Coordinated Universal Time. And this docking happened automatically. On board, the two Taikonauts were uh, veteran Jing Haipeng, who has previously been on Shenzhou-7 and the Shenzhou-9 spacecrafts, and also a first-time uh, Taikonaut, Chen Dong. They will spend 33 days in space total, preparing to 
lab for experiments and a refuel operations test next year. Now, some experiments will be conducted during this visit, and they will do lots of uh, public outreach and also guest reporting for the Chinese media. So uh, that's going to be interesting. And so congratulations to the Chinese Space Agency for the uh, successful mission so far. I hope the rest of it goes well. But uh, over to the International Space Station, that Soyuz vehicle that launched also was able to successfully rendezvous with the space station two days later instead of the, the new four-day uh, uh, rendezvous they've been doing. This took place, the docking took place at 9.52 Coordinated Universal Time. And as I said before, the crew members on board MS-02 are cosmonauts Andrei Borisenko and Sergei Rizhikov, as well as the astronaut Shane Krimbra. And they will be joining the crew of Anatoly Ivanishin, Tokoya Onishi, and Kate Rubens, who will be departing the state space station on October 29th. Now, this new crew, during their stay, a Cygnus vehicle and a Japanese HTV cargo vehicle will be docking with the International Space Station. And I love that shot right there. So beautiful. And during the time, there's also going to be at least one spacewalk planned. And then the next three crew members, who will be replacing Ivanishin, Onishi, and Rubens, should arrive in mid-November before the Japanese HTV cargo vehicle arrives in December. So congratulations to uh, NASA and Roscosmos and everyone involved at the International Space Station for having these uh, successful docking operations. Yes, now uh, turning our way back out to the solar system, a European Space Agency probes Venus Express returned a lot of data and scientists are still scouring that and they found a very interesting result coming from that. Now there is a very large mountain on Venus called Inan Mons and the use of a infrared mapping sensor has showed that was what was originally thought to be a heat anomaly actually is layered on this topographical map and it puts it squarely on top of Indium or Idan Mons. Um, now what that means is that scientists think we're essentially looking at fresh lava flows on the surface of Venus uh, coming out of this. Now, this isn't direct evidence, if you will, of actual current lava flows uh, on Venus, but scientists at, in Germany were actually able to extrapolate the data and determine where those lava flows would actually be at at different times. Um, and this is a nice little image of that chart right there. So uh, some very interesting scientific results that do need a little bit more scrutiny, um, but are sort of showing that maybe Venus really is sort of Earth's evil twin um, in that it does have volcanism uh, potentially on the surface even today. Uh, now, we're going to go from Venus to Mars. Mike, tell us a little bit about something that happened at Mars this week. Yeah, and also speaking of the European Space Agency's planetary exploration program, we're talking about the Trace Gas Orbiter, which successfully entered orbit around Mars on Wednesday. And it was successfully entered, but what we're talking about today is the, the Schiaparelli lander, which this is an animation that you're seeing on screen of what should have happened during its uh, re-entry, or rather entry and landing operations. And this whole thing, they were partnering with Russia to have a future lander and rover. Um, but with this, the data so far looks like that something went wrong and the Schiaparelli lander la crash landed into Mars instead of making a safe landing. European Space Agency doesn't yet know what happened, but the initial data looks like that the, the last signal was received 50 seconds before the expected landing time. And it also looks like the parachutes were released earlier than planned. Now, some reports are even saying that the landing thrusters only fired for three seconds, but that hasn't been confirmed by the European Space Agency yet. But even so, this lander, as a technology demonstrator and from an engineering standpoint, the European Space Agency will have a lot of useful data to pour over that the Schiaparelli uh, was able to broadcast before going silent. Now, there was a couple of images that were actually taken by one of NASA's Mars orbiters that show the predicted landing site, and there's kind of a before and after that shows where the, it possibly landed, and just based on the, the scale that they give us up at the top right-hand corner, uh, the, it looks like it's kind of a, a, a large landing zone even like a crater. That's just what it looks like to me, though. But uh, it's, it's really interesting they were able to capture this. And uh, even the uh, Opportunity rover was supposed to be able to take a couple pixels of the landing. It'll be interesting to see if they were able to capture that. But congratulations for getting the Trace Gas Orbiter into orbit. But unfortunately, I, I feel really bad for uh, the Schiaparelli not being able to land successfully. Yeah, tough luck. Mars, very difficult place in order to land. Uh, now, talking about flying and landing, when we come back from the break, 
We're going to be having Dave Mastin from Mastin Space Systems here in the studio with Ben doing that interview. So stay tuned. We'll see you right after this break. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview with Dave Mastin, I wanted to give a huge shout-out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more. They get access to absolutely everything. We've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more. They're going to get access to After Dark and a bunch of other really great rewards. To find out those reward levels and how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Long-time guest of the show, Dave Mastin. You're back on... Uh, welcome. Thank you for c driving down from the mythical lands of Mojave. <laughs> Me. So unusual, pleasant weather and everything. <laughs> it is weird. It is weird. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know, uh, who is Mastin Space Systems? So Mastin Space Systems is a small company up in Mojave. We've been, you know, like to say, we're the hipster uh, rocket company. <laughs> uh, we've been doing reusable since before it was cool. Uh, <laughs> you have. You did like the uh, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander, oh, what are we calling it now? It's the it is, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander X Prize. They change it every the, year. It's the Lunar Lander Challenge as far sure. as I'm concerned. Um, and and it, was, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, we, back in 2009, we demonstrated a small rocket-powered vehicle uh, essentially doing what you would be doing on the moon, with a, a landing and then take off and land again. And the big things were it was be able to do two of them within a very short period of time. I think it was 45 minutes to so, uh, I mean, two big, flights. As far as I know, no one's really done that yet, right? So you were landing mm -hmm. five years before any of the other big players were doing that. Yes. But you were also then reusing it within like an hour. Within, yeah, a very short period of time, turn around and, and launch again. We've done uh, a number of times where we've done multiple flights in a single day. Um, I think our record is for uh, a flight period is like 12 flights in less than a week. Um, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's a pretty good vehicle. number, yeah. That's a pretty good number. So, uh, hipster company. So, anyway, since we've been doing reusable for so long, we've now been working on uh, launch vehicles uh, with DARPA and uh, doing the XS-1 program. And this is, the XS-1 program is, is DARPA wants to do not just a reusable launch vehicle, but a launch vehicle that is truly airplane-like in operations. And one of the requirements is to do 10 flights in 10 days. We've already done that. Of course, they want a much larger vehicle than we've done before, a little higher performance. So, you know, for our competitors, uh, Northrop Grumman and Boeing, their challenge is to actually get a reusable vehicle uh, and doing 10 flights in 10 days. They've already done the same size or bigger. Um, whereas for us, well, we've already done the 10 flights in 10 days. We just got to do a larger, more pro higher performance vehicle. But in that XS1, you're going to a higher altitude. You say more performance. That's what so, you mean. More, not just higher altitude, but a higher velocity as well. So yeah, XS1 is a full uh, go take a satellite to orbit type launch vehicle. Um, where we, you know, we have not done that. We were pretty much pretty much suborbital vehicles, very low performance type vehicles up until now. And now we're working on this, you know, actually a launch vehicle. It's a small to medium size uh, launch vehicle. And Neuropilot in the chat room says, are you still working on winged re-entry vehicles? Uh, that's what this XS-1. So XS-1, our initial concept drawing that we gave out to the, the press and, and, and DARPA sent out to the press actually had wings on it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a different configuration. Um, I prefer to think of them as fins, um, <laughs> but they're kind of large even for fins. But yeah, we do need some amount of aerodynamic surfaces for what we're trying to do with it in terms of uh, basically doing the reusability and, and still maintain some performance uh, levels. So have you changed the orientation of launch or landing then? Is it, is we it... still do vertical takeoff, vertical landing. That is, Mastin will not do anything but. Um, you just, you can't land horizontally or take off horizontally from the surface of the moon. Sure. So why do I want to do that anywhere else? 
That's right. Uh, newer pilot also asks, is Lynx still a partner, or is that all dead in the water? Uh, so so X-Core was a partner for the XS1 in the early parts of phase one. Um, but what they were doing was they were literally just a, um, uh, um, how to say, uh, they, they, they were the what to do in case some of our technology development didn't go as well as we expected. Um, so there, there was sort of a redundancy uh, level to it. And uh, we got to a point in phase one where DARPA agreed with us that we actually had uh, bought down enough of the risk that we didn't need to carry an, a, another performer along with us to, to mitigate that risk. Um, so they're no longer, they, so, you know, basically they did what they needed to do, which was come in and, and, and do some of the work and make sure that we didn't have some technology risks, and we got to a point where we didn't have those technology risks, and so they said, oh, hey, you did a great job. Thank you for uh, helping us out, and uh, have a nice day. <laughs> well, they, they kind of have met, they, they're not totally gone, x -Core, but they kind of met the same fate that a lot of new space companies meet, which is uh, a lack of funding, and uh, it seems like they've kind of really shut down their Lynx program, which was their reusable space plane, uh, so they're kind of moving on but you seem to be doing all right yeah we're doing we're doing okay so far <laughs> we're holding on um and uh you know and it's basically i think we found we found a little niche that gives us enough money to keep going um and, and we actually have you know customers which helps and, and are actually able to to fly those missions in fact uh, one of those missions uh actually a series of missions that we flew for jpl has resulted in the technology that we were helping JPL test get selected for Mars 2020. Uh, which is the, uh, basically, so, Curiosity Reborn. Yeah, Curi the, uh, the next uh, Curiosity mission, mm -hmm. essentially, uh, which we'll be launching in 2020. That's, that's mm -hmm. Mars 2020. And uh, yeah, so that, I have a little piece of technology going to Mars, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, not just going to Mars, landing on Mars. So right? landing on Mars, yes. Or creating an impact crater, but we've already proven out the sky crane model, so we're but, pretty well, sure. It's, well, it's some knock on wood here, because <laughs> what we did was actually help them uh, test out some of the technology, uh, terrain relative navigation and hazard avoidance technologies that some of that is going to be used for the new mission. So. Hopefully, it does enable a nice soft landing and doesn't mess up. And why is that things. important? Why, why why is terrain navigation important? So, for ter the uh, so terrain relative navigation and hazard avoidance technologies are really important because we need to go someplace a little less boring on Mars. Because <laughs> we're choosing flat areas that we can easily Huge land. Huge flat areas that you can easily land on just are not apparently they're not scientifically exciting. The exciting stuff is where you have, you know. Maybe uh, you know deep canyons where water may have once gone. Uh, that's a little more interesting. You know, apparently geologists think the mountains and canyons and ravines are interesting. Um, so we need to see that type of, of uh, that type of geology and, and that geography. So we need to be able to land in a much tighter band. You know that 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 landing ellipse needs to be brought down in size and. Once you have a smaller landing ellipse, then we can do a lot more science with that. And that's, terrain relative navigation hazard avoidance should enable that. So uh, there was a tweet um, when we announced that you were coming on the show. It was like, oh, hope they don't talk about hiking. Because you, you, you and your wife love to hike and, and go, uh, so let's talk about hiking. So um, <laughs> exploration. <laughs> exploration right? exploration I mean, is how I like to call th it. Th that's what it is, though, right? I mean, what you're, you're talking about hazard avoidance, but you're going to need this on the vehicles that are landing on Mars because, you know, we're, for a long time, we're not going to have humans on board. But even when we do have humans on board, autonomous landing is, is a good idea. And then you have intention of going to Mars yourself. I, I would love to go to Mars. I'd love to, um, so I consider myself an explorer. I'm not the pioneer. I'm not the guy who's going to go there and stay. I do have no intention of staying on Mars when I get there. I want to come home. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to survey. I would love to survey Elon's retirement home. <laughs> and when I get done with the survey, I'm going to you know, maybe hike around, maybe explore some mountains. Uh, you know, that hiking and mountaineering stuff that I do is, you know, there's the largest mountain in the solar system, so let's go hike to the top of it. You mentioned something before the show that I didn't know. The top of Olympus Mons, which is the mountain on, on uh, Mars, on Mars. Wanna, um, is in space. It actually extends above the quote-unquote sensible atmosphere. So uh, you actually have more of the... so. 
you know, despite the hard vacuum of space, there is actually an atmosphere everywhere. It is the solar wind is what you're going to quote unquote feel mm -hmm. is what you have there. If you have the instrumentation to detect it, it's more of the solar wind than it is the Martian atmosphere at the top of Olympus Mons. So you're basically out in space on top of Olympus Mons. The, the other dirty little secret is climbing Olympus Mons uh, once you're at the edge of it, apparently, at the base of it, yeah. uh, is like just a very long and... It's uh, a long, gradual, easy to walk up slope. <laughs> it is not mountaineering <laughs> at all. <laughs> and then when you're at the top, you can feel that solar breeze <laughs> rushing against your helmet, I guess, at that point. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so you're going to go there and you're going to come back. Are you going to go there and come back on a Mastin vehicle? I would hope so. Uh, so and, you know that's that's what we're working towards. Uh, so to that end, uh, what uh, Jack asks, what is the ultimate goal of Mass and Space Systems? Um, so the ultimate goal of Mass and Space Systems is we're a space transportation company. Uh, it is our intention to have provide the transportation services anywhere in the solar system. If you're going to a solid body or maybe even a liquid surface, we'll take you there. Uh, and it doesn't matter where in the solar system. Maybe even outside the solar system too. Interesting. I feel like I should poke at that a little bit. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, hopefully someday we'll figure out how to go, um, you know, get to the higher performance uh, rocket engines and, uh, you know, maybe figure out fusion or fission or something and, and get some higher performance. And, and you know, there, there is a, uh, an effort of, darn it, I can't remember his name now, Russian billionaire who wants to send, uh, send little tiny spacecraft to... Uh, um, to Alpha Centauri, love to help him with that. <laughs> so that leads into another question from uh, user Little Blind Crippled Girl, who asks, "What is your dream rocket? Uh, can it do like three flights a day? Is it what kind of load can it do to low Earth orbit on a daily basis? What's like the Dave, Dave Mastin budget is no constraint, time is no constraint. You can build it. What's your dream rocket?" Um, I know, the two things that are always the huge constraints that keep everything down. But let's illuminate it for a moment. <laughs> um, so I don't know that I have a single dream rocket. There's, it's sort of like, what's your dream car? Well, I'm in the transportation industry, do, you know. Mm. Um, for certain routes, you know, think, think United Airlines. For certain routes, use Canada's, uh, Canada Air regional jets. For other routes, you're using 747s. And, you know, there are routes with everything in between. We're, we see the same thing. We, there are certain places where, you know, a small sat launch vehicle is the perfect thing to do and makes sense, and so that's what we'll do. In other places, you know, we need something where, you know, even Elon's not thinking big enough. Hmm. Um, but that's, you know, that's somewhere way down the line. And, that's and, a pretty big rocket. That's, yeah. a, that's a large statement. So, you know, that's... but. Uh, you know, who knows where, where that will end up being. You know, do we need, do we need you know, think about it. There's uh, little tiny tank trucks that, you know, go from gas station, from, you know, uh, refilling facilities, the tank facilities out to gas stations. Those are 5,000 gallon. You also have super tankers that are hundreds of thousands of, yeah, millions of gallons of, uh, of petroleum at a time. You need the whole range of things, so you know. I think we're going to need to do the whole range. You of mentioned things. a super tanker, so I have to mention the tweet that you <laughs> sent out, uh, which was uh, you were out looking at a what was it, an Atlas or Delta launch? Uh, it was a launch of sorts uh, with your team, and mentioned uh, you may have figured out how to turn a super tanker into a rocket. It was it was you know it's a Friday Friday afternoon, bunch of guys around the water cooler talking. And recent, re, uh, might have been an Atlas V, I think, sure. launch. I don't, I don't recall. But yeah, um, and I just was like, what is the propellant mass fraction of a super tanker? At which point, somebody else jumped on Google and started looking and was like, um, about 80%. 80%. Well, that's, that's, pretty close to, you know, reasonable rocket range. You know, normally it's 90%. Well, that does include the diesel engines. So we take out the diesel engines and we put <laughs> rocket engines in instead. And rocket engines have this thrust to weight ratio and you'll need about this amount of thrust. And the next thing you know, we've got a concept designed for a rocket based on a super tanker. <laughs> now, that's uh, very similar to something that we've brought up on the show before, which is Sea Dragon. Uh, would there, is, it, is this you guys just talking like, hey, wouldn't this be neat, or do you think there's actually something there? 
So I, I'm not sure that I, 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 there's a number of questions that still need to be answered. There's maybe there's something there. Maybe maybe something that big really does need to occur. Um, and uh, so yeah, I mean we basically just you know sort of an afternoon, a group of guys thinking about what does what does a concept design like that look like. And there's still some questions, but maybe uh, maybe it's not too uh, unreasonable. <laughs> Would you? So if, if you were thinking about it, you, you float it out to sea and then like tip it down like you would sea launch, would you? Oh, that was one, one of our guys was like, yeah, you know, we could use our Zeus technology that, you know, where we land a, a centaur on its side. And so you have your side thrusters, plus you have your main engines. So maybe you take it out to sea. And when you get out to where you know you've got your, your trajectory doesn't cross over land, you need, and you're pointed at the right inclination, you need, maybe you're down at the equator. Um, you can you can uh, light the f the engines up in the front. You can basically pop a wheelie, <laughs> light your main engines, and get going. I want to see that. That would be amazing. Oh, <laughs> that would just, be amazing. <laughs> just being a little much smaller vessel out at sea, like oh, that's a very large. Are they firing rocket <laughs> engines? <laughs> um, yeah, there's some there's some serious questions about that. But you know, it was a controls guy, so if the controls guy thinks it can be done. It might actually not be. <laughs> oh my god, I would I would love to see you working on that in the middle of the Mojave Desert, just this giant super tanker. Uh, with like the Mastin logo and a pirate flag on top or something like that. Uh, uh, the pirate flag comes after we raise up the battleship Yamato ah. and make the, turn that into yep. a spaceship. All right. Uh, uh, for those who grew up in the 70s. <coughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, going backwards in time a little bit, Destructor1701 says, in the chat room, there are a lot of questions about MXP351. This is the first I've heard of it. Please describe it. Okay. So um, I'm not going to give you as much description as you want. It's a uh, hypergolic. Uh, propellant combination. It is green um, for whatever definition of green we want. It's ba but basically, it's really about um, we. You don't need the full scape suit when you're handling the propellants like you do with the traditional hypergols. Um, you can. You still need some protective equipment. So, for those um, who don't know, hypergolic uh, fuels will basically react with. Anything like water. I mean, so well, hypergolic means that, that you have the the oxidizer component, and the fuel component, and when they touch, they ignite. You don't need an igniter. You don't need an igniter. It's it's they will ignite. They will it, you, and what the satellite industry loves about that is that you, they touch, they will ignite. You will their <laughs> your engine is going. <laughs> they love that you don't need an igniter. You don't have a point of failure yeah, out in you, space. You don't have a point of failure when you're out in space. They're extremely reliable. So. We've come up with a combination. We've been working. This is uh, a lot of the work has been done in conjunction with NASA on the Catalyst program, um, and we've basically worked out a way of getting these two particular uh, chemicals. Uh, they come together. They they ignite. They're actually very easy to handle. Um, instead of a full scape suit, all you need to do is basically wear eye protection um, and gloves. Uh, we do uh, one of the uh, an MSDS for one of the things said maybe you might want to wear a respirator. Eh. So we said okay, we'll wear a respirator. Not a big deal. Um, so, but uh, generally, it, it's uh, the stuff is non toxic. You can handle it. If you were to inhale it, you're not going to die in the next couple of seconds. You don't have to go to the hospital. <laughs> Um, if you if well, you wait. If you inhale a hypergol like today, there is not going to a hospital, right? I mean, you're you're. It basically... depends on which of those two you you inhale. All right. One All of right. them, one of them, you're pretty much dead. You're gone. Forget right. it. The other one, you may have to go to the hospital. I guess that's one I'm chance. I'm used to work or considering with aerospace, right? It basically will react with anything. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it will react with anything, including <laughs> the tissues in your lungs. Right. And yeah, water. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's right. not a it's not a fun thing. Um. Yeah. The the uh, the hydrazine is not necessary. A, a terrible thing. I've, I've understand that some people have accidentally breathed hydrazine and are talking about it. Hmm. Um, on the other hand, the uh, the red fumic nitric acid is uh, a little bit worse. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, it's it's the it, and there's a lot of details because we don't actually use hydrazine. It's more like uh, aerozine, which is some weird combination of hydrazine and other things that makes it worse. <laughs> so. Um, uh, it's much greener, so better for the environment, because traditionally hypergols are not super awesome. Actually, you, you see like space disasters, and they tell you don't go anywhere near their vehicle. It's very toxic. That's generally the hypergolic fuels. 
Um, so it's green, uh, but what about, uh, it's easier to work with, so it's safer, yep. uh, but are there any words on like price? Is it less expensive? Is it more expensive or is that irrelevant? Um, well, um, just because it's easier to work with mm -hmm. makes it less expensive. Okay. The actual cost of buying the chemical is, is in the noise compared to the cost of actually loading it onto a satellite um, and actually working with it. So yeah, it's, it's because it's easier to work with, it makes it a lot cheaper. All right, uh, let's move even further backwards, uh, kind of to the, back, the beginning of the interview because we're jumping all around with the chat room. Okay. Uh, uh, a Vax headroom was, what is the maximum altitude you've achieved with your vehicles and how long uh, can you provide a flight in micro, uh, can a flight provide microgravity? Um, so how so, long can you stay in? So in we haven't space? actually we haven't actually gotten to microgravity levels yet. Um, our highest flight, shoot, we just had this discussion in an email conversation. We were like trying to figure out what our highest uh, altitude was because we think we we came very close to it uh, this past week. Um, I want to say it's around successful flight is around 500 meters. But it's not, you know, we, so hear, foot. we hear Elon and SpaceX talk about this a lot. It's, it's not the altitude, it's the velocity that is the hard part, right? Because you're talking about doing low Earth orbit, you know, low Earth orbit missions with like XS1. That's not height, that's speed. Yeah, it's all about the velocity at that point. And, and to a certain extent, um, up to a point, uh, say 100 kilometers or so, um, or, you know, orbital velocities, up to about, you know, getting to the edge of space, it's speed and height are one and the same. Once you're starting to go to orbit, then it's all about the velocity after that. Um, and, and altitude has little to do with it. But that impacts your recoverability as well, right? I mean, that, that, that's, yeah. what, that's what makes reusability, I mean, you're, you're known for reusability, but this is, a, this is a nut that you haven't cracked yet, is it, is it not? So, so it is something that we haven't, yeah, we haven't gone the really fast yet. We haven't done the really fast. Um, but I mean, there, there's a lot of different things you have to deal with for reusability. Um, one of the things is, can you even get a rocket engine to light, shut down, light again, hmm. um, repeatedly? And then how often can you repeat that before you have to take it apart and do maintenance? You know, between shuttle flights, that was one of the things. Now, um, early in the pro shuttle program, they absolutely positively had to take the shuttle engines apart and rebuild them every single time. Hmm. Um, now, my understanding is by the end of the program, um, by the time they retired shuttle, they did, but they really didn't have to take the engines off. Like, they took them apart, they, they checked it out, rebuilt it, but they really didn't have the wear and tear. So, like, maybe they're thinking, hey, you know, maybe we are getting to a level of reusability um, that might be, you know, more like an airplane where you land. You don't, you don't tear apart an airplane engine every time you land. Right. You know, so, um, and so that's an interesting question. And, I, you know, I don't know, you know, SpaceX and, and uh, Blue Origin, have, how much time do they spend on engine rework after they land? You know, are they just inspecting or do they have to clean the heck out of them? Mm -hmm. um, and, or, you know, or even tear them apart and rebuild them. Um, how about you? How are, much time? I mean, obviously you're being able to fly within 45 minutes, so I have to assume the answer is like zero. <laughs> we figured it out to where you don't have to take apart an engine. You don't have to, you know, you just sort of look at it and say, yeah, well, that still looks like an engine. <laughs> So what is, uh, this is from Tarantula, what is the biggest challenge for quick turnaround of your reusable vehicles then? So I think the biggest challenges are in the, um, the propulsion system. Um, and then uh, once you start doing things like going to space um, and doing much higher velocities, uh, thermal protection systems. Hmm. Making uh, sure that you don't burn up. Don't burn up on re-entry, yeah. And uh, that's, that's sort of the hard part. That's sort of the, the, the part that we need a lot more work on, quite frankly. It's Why is it hard? I thought, it feels like there are a billion different ter thermal protection systems. You got the tiles from the shuttle, you got blankets, you've got PICA from NASA. I mean, what? So you have things like PICA from NASA, which aren't so reusable. It's ablative. Sure. And so by definition, you're burning up a portion of it as you, as you come in. Maybe you can reuse it a second or third time if, it, if the reentry wasn't as bad as you expected. Um, but you really need something where you're not going to replace it after every flight or every two flights or every, you know, you don't want to replace it until after you've done a few hundred flights. And that becomes difficult. Now on the shuttle, uh, the shuttle used a lot of what um, uh, RCC, um, let's say a carbon carbon composite. Mm -hmm. And it had the problem of if you, you know, the reentry part might go just perfectly fine. It lost a lot of tiles. 
Um, they had constant problems with uh, losing tiles, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, so you had that replacement work. But also, you, you, know, you couldn't land in the rain because just a raindrop hitting it, it was going fast enough, and the carbon composite, the carbon carbon, is so brittle that a raindrop hitting it will crack it. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. I did not know they could not land in the rain. So yeah, they couldn't land in the rain. That's why they oftentimes had to land at Edwards. Huh. Is because, oh, it looks like it's going to rain and it's going to keep raining through our entry window. So let's shift to Edwards so that you, we can land this mission. And that one time at White Sands. And one, there and one time they landed land, there yes. once, and they said, "We're never doing that again." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that, so yeah, and and so there's a lot of materials issues with thermal protection systems for doing a reentry, and uh, and uh, I think we actually have some uh, some answers for that. I'm excited to see that in the future when that. Uh, so, do you have any? Are you allowed? Are you able to give out any timelines? Because I know that XS1. Uh, you know, the, the DARPA, they kind of did their, it's done in phases, and the first phase yep. is basically done, and we're kind of waiting on phase two. Right, uh, right. Are you going to move, I mean, like, do you need them to do phase two, or can you just continue moving forward without that? What um, well, whatever, whatever their ultimate decisions are, we're going to keep moving. Um, we may change direction a little bit, like we might change the size of the vehicle. Um, not sure that, I mean, DARPA's, DARPA's XS1 vehicle may be a little larger than what we really, really, really want to do. Mm. So okay, so what do you really, really want to do then? So right now, I really, really want to concentrate on small sat. Okay. Launch. Um, I think there's a really nice um, opening there, and that's. Yeah, how, that's how large is a small sat? What do you What do you define as a small sat? Um, well, traditionally, small sat is anything that's 100 kilograms or less. All right. Um, for a satellite size, I'm stretching that a little bit. I think maybe 250 kilos, 300 kilos is probably the uh, a sweeter spot for launch capability. All right. Um, but generally, you know, looking at most of the market is less than 100 kilos. There's enough of the between 100 and 300 that we think that makes a more sensible size. And what are you working on with XS1? So XS1 was uh, 3,000 to 5,000 pounds to orbit, so about uh, 1,400 or so kilos. So quite a bit more. So quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's all... Uh, XS1 is single stage to orbit reuse. Well, it doesn't no, it have isn't. to be. No, no, no. It, but it's definitely reusable. It is definitely reusable. Do if you did multi stage to orbit, do all stages need to be no. reusable? No, it's ah. just a booster stage for XS1. Interesting, interesting. And, uh, I didn't realize that. And that, that was sort of another thing that that's the, you know sort of another change there is I want to make that upper stage reusable. Hmm. Um, and so there is a little bit of a. Uh, you know, well, because in your in your initial drawings, it looked like you were single stage to orbit, like with the the wing diversion, right? A giant airplane. So we had the wing, thing. but it was yeah, it was a booster. So there was when the XS one program started, there were two missions for it. There was the go to orbit, mm -hmm. and it was also a do a Mach ten scramjet kind of ve a vehicle that could carry a scramjet experiment. Okay. Um, so basically, hypersonic experiments for the Air Force. The Air Force is really interested in doing a lot more testing in hypersonic environments. And they thought that, you know, if you could go to orbit, then well, obviously you can do a Mach 10 hypersonic experiment. As we got through the program, well, no, that's not really true. You really want to dedicate a vehicle for hypersonics. And it's either for launch or it's for hypersonics. You're really not going to do the same vehicle for both. So they sort of dropped the hypersonic requirement towards the end. And then you would actually take it, if, if phase two doesn't happen or if you're not selected, you would take it and scale it down even more. We're just going to scale it smaller. down and do our own. Because you want to be fully thing. reusable. That's but, yeah. what Mass Yes, Space exactly. Does. So uh, here's an interesting comment um, from Lars von Braun, uh, maybe you can speak to. It says, I really want to like Mass and Space Systems, but I feel like they're not very far along. feels like they're more dreamers than anything else at this time. Uh, are you just... Talking about this stuff? Are you building this stuff? Where are you? Well, I mean, we don't hear a lot about you, we're right? We're building stuff. We're launching stuff. Um, you know, we're not we're not billionaires. We're not <laughs> we're not backed by a billionaire, so it's just taking a little bit more time for us to do stuff. Um, and unfortunately, because we because the government has been helping us with uh, you know contracts for our launch vehicle, we're getting a lot of assistance from DARPA through the XS1 program to do a launch vehicle, then yeah, um, guess what? We can't tweet about it. Well, we can, but in order to tweet about something exciting that we did for XS1, for example, we recently did some engine testing. 
um, for XS1. In order to tweet about it, I have to put in a request for media release to the bureaucracy. Feels like it feels like it's hilarious that you 140 characters you have to have this request. Yes, <laughs> and two weeks later, I get a question about it. <laughs> I, you know, social media nowadays is you have a four-hour relevancy window. Sure. You know, if, if you're not talk, if you don't tweet it out in four hours, you're not relevant. So, if I got to wait two weeks, forget it. So our, our social media is just you know taking a dive, basically. I think we pretty much tweet about uh, being on tomorrow, and uh, we tweet about um, job openings. <laughs> so you're, you're kind of, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, in blue origin mode right now, where uh, you're doing a lot of stuff, but no one can see what you're doing. Exactly. And then someday, once you're able to do it, these floodgates will open and be like, oh, actually, we have all of these vehicles. Because you have engines. You are flying things. You're making stuff. You're bending hardware. You're not just talking about it. You actually have a whole campus now up in. Yeah, we have a whole campus. We have five buildings now. Um, you know, our staff has grown considerably. We're about three or four times what we were a couple of years ago, um, and we're doing a lot of cool stuff. But because we're working a lot more with the government, we're actually getting government contracts to support a lot of our development activities. You know, we have to go through this whole long spiel for getting stuff, you know, to tweet about stuff, and so it doesn't get us talked about as much. And, and you just sort of, well, let's, you know, let's keep working. We can do that. <laughs> they don't stop us from doing that. All right, uh, a couple last questions. Uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit again. Uh, one more is uh, that you really got the chat room all riled up over uh, MXP351. Uh, so, if, if you can, yeah, I know, you're like, oh, God, don't ask this question. Uh, uh, don't answer it if you can't, but uh, we determined it's cheaper, safer, uh, but can you produce it off of Earth? So, let's say you go to Mars and you want to build a vehicle and refuel it on Mars. Could you go to Mars and create it there from only elements found on Mars? Well, I mean, technically it is, you know, elements that are found just about everywhere in the universe so yes we could um, how much effort would it take I don't, I don't know I mean it's probably not as easy as just cracking water to get hydrogen and oxygen hmm. um, although one of the components uh, pretty much if you have water we can make you one of the components so um, but yeah no I, I, I you could. That's a solid All the maybe. elements are there. It's, <laughs> but it is, yeah, I mean, question, I mean, we don't have any technology to make propellants off Earth right now anyway. So, That's you know, fair. no, you, you can't. Um, and I don't care if, if it's like when I, um, but theoretically you could. Just, but no, I don't think anybody actually has that technology right now. All right, this is a great question to take us into break. So this will be the last question for you. This one's easy, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and that is from Dr. 1701. Do you have any job openings right now? I don't think we're hiring right at the moment. But if you, uh, if you do in the future, where should people go for that information? In the future, uh, Maston.Aero, A-E-R-O. Um, Did you know that there's a dot .space uh, top-level domain now? You can actually own Maston.Space? Um, I'll make sure to uh, let, uh, <laughs> let our, our people know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we, found, we found that out the other day. So, yeah, there is a whole new slew of things. So I think that'd be pretty cool. All right, Dave, it is always fun having you on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that was uh, not too painful. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal 
will serve to organize a vision of history. Hello, our energies and space. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with viewer comments from this last week's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. They're going to get absolutely everything. We've also got our tomorrow producers. They've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And the people who are going to get access to After Dark early, that's going to be our tomorrow Patreon Plus subscribers. These are people who have contributed $2.50. But wait, there's even more. You can contribute as little as $1 per episode and get your name in the show. To find out more information as to all those different reward levels and what you get, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, uh, and a huge thank you to all of our patrons uh, for helping to make all of that uh, happen. Uh, let's, uh, let's get started with uh, some comments from uh, last week's show. What was our uh, topic last week? Uh, it was Dato is Beautiful. Uh, we're talking about... Uh, um, Flight Club I.O. Uh, Flight Club I.O. and yes. how you can do... <laughs> um, thanks. It was uh, and how you can do uh, some beautiful graphing and like real time charts of where the rockets are and uh, whatnot. So Capcom, take us away. Uh, okay. First one comes off of YouTube. This one comes from Fabio Milan. Says uh, we only know the human body behaves under two conditions: one G and no G. We need more samples before we can say or predict anything about how the body will react in other conditions. The Moon, one six G. The Mars, the Mars. I should the guess. Mars. It's the Mars. Well, that's the, the one hundred five. So it might as well be the Mars. Uh, is one third G may provide more entry points to this chart. Uh, yes. Right, Dave, you'll you'll help <laughs> you'll help us with that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dave, Dave gives us a thumbs up. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you know we did have experiments for space station that were like a centrifuge and other ways to do these, uh, you know, test these things. In fact, we built them, and they're sitting in Japan right now. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And they will never fly, unfortunately, or at least there are no plans to have them fly at this time. So. Uh, you're right, we do need to do these tests and understand what's going on there, and we have the experiments, we're just, for whatever reason, choosing not to uh, send them up, which is, I think, somewhat sad. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, next up, Capcom. Next one also comes off of YouTube. This one comes from Stuart Young. Uh, president Obama. Uh, it's gratifying to see a president taking some time to participate in some boyhood fantasy dreaming at this extremely difficult point in history. It always shocks me how gray he's become. That happens to all the presidents. Have you ever noticed? Yeah, yeah. well, eight years under super stressful situations, you I, try to not turn gray. they do. They, so age, yes. they age like 20 years in eight. It doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, offhand, I think it's... I can't think of a president who's taken more of a consistent interest in space since Lyndon B. Johnson, which was 1965 to 1969, for those of you who don't know. Well, I mean... I mean, I think, I think it's great that he is showing this interest and has, you know, tried to be consistent. And, you know, we say consistent, but a lot of people complain when he, you know, changed uh, the plan when his administration took office, uh, that it was somewhat vague. But, you know, as we were talking about the new story that I was talking about this with, I mean, I feel that his legacy is helping to enable all of this uh, public-private partnerships and having the commercial crew program, the commercial cargo that's program. that's not his legacy. All these other things. That but didn't start that under his program. That was already started, but he was something who was able to further that and give support to that and urge Congress and the Senate to vote in favor of programs like that, whereas before they didn't, they didn't necessarily want to throw as much money towards programs. Yeah, like I mean, that. and to be clear, uh, the, the COTS program started under uh, the Bush administration, 
What? Sorry. <laughs> Sector 1701 says uh, Abe Lincoln. No interest in space exploration at all. Totally worthless. Sorry. I just. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so George Washington didn't care about space at all. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, COTS in, in the commercial space stuff really started uh, mostly under the Bush administration, specifically under uh, Mike Griffin's NASA administration. They're the ones who kind of helped, you know, dream that up. And then it was. The Obama administration certainly did help, but I think there was a really big push from Deputy Administra NASA Administrator Lori Garver, who really championed this Quite a bit. and took it and ran with it and like made it kind of like their thing, like th we shouldn't be doing this. And she really fought. I mean, she fought for it. Yeah. She fought, in my opinion, she fought for it more than Administrator Bolden did. I mean, she was the one who really made it happen. Yep. And yeah, yeah. I mean, President uh, Obama certainly kind of had some. He helped Neat space stuff, but he helped sort of define the funding that was necessary. I guess I just felt like yes. his administration, like his view of space, was uninspired and just boring, lackluster. It was lackluster, and yeah. I mean, it's neat that he enjoys this stuff, but I was I was constantly disappointed. I, for better or worse, go back to the moon. Oh, I forgot to ask Dave. We'll have to ask him in After Dark. Uh, we're trying to ask everyone Moon or Mars first. And the reason I forgot to ask Dave is because I know the answer. Uh, but yeah, we, we uh, so anyhow, <laughs> I'm what actually surprised. This is and crack up day. You guys all suck. Uh, <laughs> Dunn is, Dun is in the, he's in the, stu in the studio, what am I trying to say? He's control in the control room. room and he just like stands up and he's a formidable guy and he's wearing a shirt that says Moon first and he's like, eh? <laughs> 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 Uh, Good so, times. uh, all right. So there, <laughs> there you go. I don't know. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Obama administration did a lot more than I'm not giving them credit for. If, that, if that's the case and you, and you do know something there, um, certainly post it in the comments and, and let me know why I'm wrong. But otherwise yes. I just, I feel like, um, really it was even, you know, the Bush administration did help start some of these COTS programs and whatnot, but every, every program has been underfunded. So, I mean, yeah, great. You can have an idea and you can go, hey, let's do this. But if you're going to steal all the funding and drop it on a giant rocket that won't fly, um, I don't. It, yeah, then you, it's very difficult then it's, to it's understand difficult. that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Next up. Next up. Oh, my God. You're kidding. I didn't. How many pages is this? Dada? Four. Four pages. <laughs> Hang on. Dada uh, don't care. While we go to this, I'm just going to stare at Dada the entire time. Dada don't go ahead. care. Okay. Uh, so this one comes off of Reddit. I'm going to have a drink. You probably should. Uh, you could probably go to the bathroom, actually, during all this. Uh, it's, You're going to have some time, people. This one's from Brandon Mark. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, 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 another U.S. president who has another Mars plan slated to happen in, oh, you guessed it, about 20 years. I wish I could attend a speech like this and throw a pie in the guy's face. You know what? Bolden too. I feel like every single U.S. president in my lifetime has promised we'd go back to the moon and then Mars, and every single time, it's 15 to 20 years away. Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, same story every single time. Why should anyone take these people seriously? It's like Charlie Brown and Lucy with a stupid football. I'm convinced politicians, <laughs> by and large, really don't care about space flight. They want DOD contractors to stay in the black while they want U.S. missile engineers to stay in practice. And as far as NASA and its dreams, it's no, it's good PR vehicle to convince millennials to pay their taxes. Also of note, 20 years is convincing conveniently far enough in the future that nobody will remember or care what the president said in 2016. And Obama certainly won't have to shoulder the responsibility for the policy or the spending to make a Mars mission happen. Double convenient. Am I bitter? Hell yeah. I was promised an awesome future time and time again. I'm older, but the awesomeness is still frustratingly, quote unquote, only 20 years away. I think I'd rather keep my tax money, thank you very much, and I'd rather pin my hopes on fickle politicians. I'll just watch Elon Musk demonstrate how worthless these 20-year plans really are when he accomplishes it in far less. Maybe it won't be 10 years. Maybe it'll be less than 15. I had enough time to go into, into the other room, grab a soda and a mug. That was a long comment, Dada. Yes. Although a, a, a fairly passionate plea... <laughs> and that's why Dada <laughs> yells. Very yes. passionate plea, um, and not necessarily wrong. Uh, you know, I'll argue that today's guest, Dave Mastin, may be able to do it in less time as well. Um, I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't know that it's it's politicians that don't want to see success. You know, you, you just need to understand what their, their role here is, and that's that they want to create jobs for their district, and they don't want their constituents to be out of work because then they're not going to get reelected. Yeah. And, I mean, in the space industry, we hate that. That sucks. We don't want to see that. But you can understand where they're coming from, at least, right? So I, I would make the argument that what we need to do is change the – the idea and concept that instead of building big rockets to nowhere that will keep people employed, if we instead create new industry, you'll employ even more people in your district by letting the market mature into a way in which we're not just working here on Earth, but we're also working out in space. And I, I think that will create all new jobs, all new industry, all new manufacturing at a scale of which we have not seen before. And I, I think that scale is so large that they can't even fathom it. And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, but if we can do that, then, then and convince politicians of that and actually work towards that model, then I, I do think government would play an incredible role in making that happen. Mm -hmm. Also, you look at small space companies, uh, NASA, new space companies, NASA, and even Dave, good chunk of that funding is coming from government. So they're not, it's not that they're evil, it's just that there are certain very small factions that are doing, that have a lot of control over money. They're mm -hmm. doing things that we disagree with. Yes. There you go. Sounds about right. I think that kind of goes back into the whole, um, you know, public-private partnerships. You know, all these new space companies that could accomplish the goal of going to the moon and Mars in, you know, less than 20 years, like you said, are getting a lot of their funding right now from NASA. And I think that that, you know, the, the past eight years have kind of helped to foster this kind of new contracting that they have instead of doing cost plus contracting. You know, it's fixed price contracting to do a certain goal. And, and I think that it's for the better for all the reasons that you, that you just said. And because this is the political system that we have, we need to work within that system. And I think that just the amount of successes that we've seen in, in the, the recent past is starting to convince more and more politicians that maybe this is such a, a good idea and will create an industry. That's just my opinion anyway. Yeah, and that gets, us in, that gets me into my whole cost plus isn't necessarily a bad idea. You just can't use it everywhere and it can't be abused. There actually yes. is a, that's a different conversation for a different time, though. It's kind of like the solid, yeah. the solid fuel versus liquid fuel argument. It, yes. There are places for each one of them. Each one yes. of them has their pros and cons. You just have to understand them and apply them appropriately. And when you don't do that, bad things happen. Yes. So, all right. I don't know how I went. <laughs> uh, oh, hey, I'm being told to do this. There you go. All right. Um, <laughs> next up. Or is this the last one? Yeah. All right. Last one. Capcom. It also comes off of YouTube. This was from Josh Willis. It says, it's a little screwed up to be so flippant about the theories around Tabby Star. We don't know what it is. So at this point, a Dyson Swarm is still on the table, though very, very unlikely. Biases can influence the way data is perceived. So it's very important to not let our own lack of knowledge color what the data may very well be saying. Hmm. Jared? Well, I mean... I'll throw this out here, which is that Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary ideas require extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. So um, in science, we don't jump to the fantastical immediately when we're working on things. We work But first. we want to, Jared. We want it's so to. fantastical. It's so much it's fun. It's such a better story. It's like the best thing ever to just say aliens and then work with it. But there's a problem with that, which is that in science, you have to first look at the obvious. And that's really what you do. You throw the obvious guess at it, and you see if that sticks on the wall. If it sticks on the wall, there you go. You found it. Um, unless somebody else comes in and looks at your obvious guess and says, no, that's wrong. Here's another one. And then that sticks to the wall. Okay, maybe it sticks a bit better than the other one did, so you compromise with it. So, um, sorry, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not here to sugarcoat or try to try to give you uh, some kind of Star Wars answer um, with everything. I'm just going to tell you what we know. Um, and the fact is, with Tabby Star, we don't know. Um, but the chances of it being a swarm of comets is probably a lot higher than it being aliens. So just throwing that out there. Sorry. It's, I mean, I would love for it to be a Dyson Sphere and we find out that there's intelligent life out there. But guess what? It's probably not what it is. And because that's not probably, and because the chances of that are so much smaller than any other potential answer, nobody's really going to pursue it because you're not going to be able to fund the study to even think about, 
you know, doing stuff like that. You know, it's going to be fun. In early December, Fraser Kane of um, Universe Today is going to be on. And he and I have somewhat different views on the possibility of intelligent life out there. Yes. And he actually basically says, um, no, it's not out there. It's, it's almost certainly just us. Uh, and I, I am of the opinion that there's almost certainly intelligent life out there. It's just never been here. Yes. Uh, so uh, that uh, taking that conversation, like, I think that is going to be a fascinating and fun show. Yes. Because he actually has very compelling arguments. So uh, uh, hopefully my arguments are as compelling as his, slash he's smarter than I am, so he might just win that by debate. That's yeah. so that December 3rd, in case you December can. 3rd is when that uh, particular debate. He was actually going to be on uh, a couple weeks ago, but mm -hmm. our bandwidth issues pre unfortunately prevented him from coming on. So yeah. uh, I'm excited for that debate to actually occur. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, so. next week's show, we're going to have a longtime viewer and contributor to the show, Amory Stagmer, also known as Vax Headroom. He's going to be on, and we're going to be talking small sats. So very apt uh, to go from Dave Mastin to Emery, uh, who also act actually this is a really great transition because he also has been on talking about Sea Dragon before, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know some of the floating <laughs> super. <laughs> Dave's yeah, laughing. Exactly right. So uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So. Uh, Everyone, thank you so much for watching. After Dark is up next. If you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, you're going to get that as soon as it's posted on demand. Everyone else, that'll be available in about a month, and we'll see you guys next week.